Good afternoon. I'm Tim Apicella. I'm your host with Moving Hawaii Forward. And today's show is titled Aerial Mobility, Hawaiian Skies Are the Limit. And as the title would suggest, we're going to talk about mobility through the skies and um, not our traditional discussion about rail or bus or bike or walk. This is an innovative topic and I'm very much looking forward to it. With me today I have Nicole Hori and she is actually a board member of Think Tech Hawaii. But she's going to talk about one of her passions and that is um, aerial gondolas. And so Nicole, thank you very thank much you for coming so on the much show. For Appreciate me. it. Yes, this is going to be good. Yeah. So um, I know you did a lot of research to find out about the aerial systems that are existent around the world before the show. Yeah, there's and a lot out there. There are. And what I'm noticing is that Europe and all over the world, um, they're using and implementing these systems of mobility, and the United States is not so much. Well, yeah, there's uh, definitely uh, projects that are being proposed. So I think everyone's excited about the proposal for Austin. Uh, there is a proposal for the Georgetown area near the capital where um, it would be um, a system with three stations. And that's actually just uh, been approved as a, well, it's been, the feasibility study's been done. And it's oh, been shown exciting. to be feasible. So that's exciting. Um, well, in my research, I mean, I was just constantly <laughs> amazed on some of the advantages of to uh, an aerial gondola, or, or I, I've used the term uh, tramway. But um, one of the things that I thought was very interesting is that you have consistent travel times. You have a continuous transportation of it. You have smaller capital investments. Uh, you have operating costs. And the thing that really caught my mind is they're quick to build. Yes, yes. So tell me a little bit more about that. So um, generally they say the <coughs> construction time is between 18 to 24 months. But there is a system that just went up in Berlin. They're having a flower show and there's a large park outside of Berlin where they just installed a monocable gondola. They started constructing it. I think the first tower was being put up uh, in March last year. And then by September they're already doing test runs. So wow, it's pretty a, amazing. That I mean, is amazing. They're planning to bring that on service for the 2017 show. So just over a year. But that um, is unbelievably it fast. Goes, <laughs> it um, <is. laughs> when I think on gondola, obviously, you know, I have a, a stereotypical image of my mm -hmm. brain because when I go skiing, I'm usually in a gondola. Mm -hmm. But it's yeah. far beyond that. I mean, it's much larger. In fact, these gondolas sometimes go hold how many people? As well, 35 <coughs> passengers. 35 so passengers. Yeah, so you only have seating for either 20 or 24 passengers, depending on the design. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry, 24 or 28 passengers. Right. So if it's full, actually 80% of the passengers would be seated, which is a big advantage. Um, and then, you know, if you have a smaller system, you could do uh, 10 passengers. Mm -hmm. But for what we're proposing here in Honolulu, we would go with a 35 passenger car. That would be yeah. unbelievably yeah. great. Um, I understand it can move so many people per hour. Do you know what that number is? Yes. I've seen different numbers on that. Uh, depending on what <coughs> settings you choose, um, it could be five to 6,000 for the maximum capacity of the system. But if they don't expect demand to be that high, a lot mm -hmm. of cities will just have the cars coming less often. So you might space them 90 seconds apart instead, and you have a, you know, a much lower um, ridership capacity, but as long as it meets your needs, it's still a system that can, you know, be very practical for the local residents. And is there a distance? Um, is there a maximum distance that these things can be implemented in? So I think one of the longest systems in, that's being proposed right now mm -hmm. is actually something that the city of Branson, Missouri, just signed a memorandum of understanding with some developers for. And that would be, I believe, nine kilometers. Nine miles. So, well, nine kilometers. Oh, sorry. So <laughs> we get to go up. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So I mean, that, that is a very long system. Um, and then it would have multiple stops. At, and it's more oriented towards tourists. Right. But um, there's other ones, such as the Peak to Peak at Whistler, that mm -hmm. have enormous spans. It's possible to have a uh, distance between two towers that's um, about three kilometers. Do you so, need to have it from an upper elevation that, then goes, that goes down to a lower elevation, or can you have it as a constant elevation? So if we're looking <coughs> for... Um, where to place the towers for a constant elevation system. Mm -hmm. We would place smaller towers closer together. Um, they would hold the uh, two uh, 
travel paths closer together as well uh -huh. so that we minimize the footprint and the air rights that are required. Um, we don't want to affect the buildings on either side, but it is something that's feasible right. for an urban environment. Now, a lot of these, obviously, you go on websites and you look at the one up in the Matterhorn. It's 12,000 <laughs> 12, feet up in the air. I mean, that's phenomenal. Yes. Uh, particularly in the mountains, you have this airstream that's 12,000 miles or 12,000 feet up in the air. That's, so they, they, they hold up the sustained winds then quite well. Yes, the manufacturers say up to 100 kilometers an hour. Mm -hmm. So, you know, even when we have high winds here on Oahu, it's, you know, very rarely... Um, so that doesn't pose know, a problem gusting. at all. And how, how fast do these things move? So uh, the ones we're looking at are 8.5 meters per second which translates to about 19 miles an hour. Yeah. And um, you have to add in time to stop at the station or just slow down at the station for people to get on and off. Right. But it's still a pretty quick system when you compare it with things like the bus or, you right. know. No, I, I mean, I, I really have never thought of this before. And I've been in the transportation business for 17 years. So um, aerial mobility is, this is a new concept. And I find it quite exciting to research it. So let me ask you this, um, mm -hmm. is it a point a to point B, or can you have stops in between? Is it really designed for um, kind of a, a one-stop method of, of, yeah. of transportation? Well, actually, maybe we can go to one of the pictures at Okay, this point. let's take a look at them. There's a route map um, that I've developed. So basically, you know, looking at where the demand is for people coming off the rail, you'll have a lot of people who are headed either for Waikiki or who are headed for the university. So in order to connect those points, in order for us to, you know, um, uh, also serve the convention center and Pucks Alley area, we can put in stations that are midpoints. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. are those relatively low to the ground, or do you have, is there so a stairwell system that will need to be? they could be elevated, or they could be low to the ground. Okay, and there are some pictures later on where you can see, um, mm -hmm. you know, the different options that uh, designers yeah. have. I know with, be it a um, transit system or a transit development or a rail development, we always have the challenge, and, and it's a good mm -hmm. challenge, of American Disability Act um, access. Right, And right. so I was wondering, you know, maybe how that would complicate matters with a, a system like this. Yeah, so that's actually one of the reasons to go with a larger 35 passenger car system, mm -hmm. because then it's large enough that you can have wheelchairs and strollers and bikes, um, probably not during the two hours of peak travel time, but you could have, you know, a way to carry your bike uh, at other times during the day. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm familiar with a little bit because um, I have family in New York, and uh, mm -hmm. I've been to the Roosevelt Island area and oh. um, have ridden that tram. And I didn't realize that tram actually started back in the mid-70s, back in 1976. Um, how is that different? For that, In fact, that's one of the very few systems mm -hmm. in the United States that we actually use it for mobility yes. rather than, you know, in mountain resorts and, and things yeah. like that nature. Yeah. So what do you know about the Roosevelt system? Well, that one... Um, Roosevelt Island system, <laughs> excuse me. That one's a tram. Mm -hmm. So basically you have the cars trading places and instead of a gondola where you have many cars uh, traveling at once and then them just detaching off the line once they get to the station, you'll actually, I believe, have the uh, trams fixed to the line. So when one car is moving, the other car is moving, um, but then you can have much higher capacity. So right. in terms of the number of passengers in a single car, um, in some cases it's up to 200. I believe the one in Portland has about 75 passengers per car. And, you know, it's you know, sometimes there's a coffee shop inside. They, really? They, yeah, yeah. Coffee so, shop. So it's, it's, it's a much uh, bigger technology, but then you also don't have departures as frequent. Oh, so I see. Okay. the advantage of the gondola for an urban setting is that as soon as you get to the station, you just walk on. You might wait 10 seconds on average to get to the next car, and then you just board. There's no and so that's checking a schedule or any of that. Right, you don't need a mm -hmm. schedule. So that's where that concept of continuous transportation plays yes. in. There's always a car, and it's always continuous. Mm -hmm. So you're not at a, at a particular time point. There's just always a car ready to go. Yeah. Fascinating. Well, you came here with some photos, so let's yes, uh, let's yes. take a look at some of those and uh, be interesting to have you walk walk me through those. Okay, so here is a proposed system for Chicago. You can see how they envision it fitting in with the urban environment. Um, it's relatively low compared to the buildings around it, um, and it really for them would be a great sightseeing opportunity. 
um, I'm envisioning it as much more of a commuter thing for Honolulu, but um, it does look like it would be fun to ride, and you know their renderings are just gorgeous. Yeah. There's also a picture here from a uh, new sta uh, station that's being planned for Toulouse, France. So this is actually the fourth largest la fourth largest city in France, and connecting to a metro stop would be this three station system. They actually just signed a contract for $57 million to have it constructed. So it is... Did um, you say $57 million? $57 million. That's so nothing. So three stations, and then it's going to be three kilometers in total length. It's going to go from a university up to a medical uh, facility, and then there's also a tech park, a mm -hmm. research park, that's the third station. So right now, it takes them about 30 minutes to go from one end to the other, from the university to the tech park, and with this system, they'll be able to do that in 10 minutes. In 10 and minutes. it's not even running particularly fast. Right. Um, you could, you know, speed it up if you wanted to, and I'm planning on our system being a little faster um, to go I mean, between the stations. In relative dollar terms, $57 million is a drop in the bucket compared to what numbers we've it, been running through. It okay. seems quite reasonable. Yeah. Okay. Um, this one is in Berlin. So this is the one I was telling you about that they were constructing a you know, crazy fast speed. Um, it is part of a garden exhibition, so you can see that they used the green roof technology and gorgeous architecture since they are planning on this being a tourist event. Um, I'm actually not sure how much it costs because this is something where the manufacturer is putting it in for three years and they're covering um, that through a share of the ticket sales for the show, uh, but also as a demonstration project. And then after three years, they'll revisit it. Um, I don't know if they'll actually end up uh, keeping the system, but as um, you'll see with the Koblenz system, which was um, the site of a Gondola for a previous garden show, the community decided they liked it so much they wanted it right? to stay. Yes. Interesting. Here's another one that's uh, for a uh, ski area. Uh, this is in France, and uh, it's just in a good example of, and a good view of what the station size could be. This is... Um, That's fairly low impact. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. Not a lot of real estate there. Yeah, and here is the Koblenz uh, uh, station. So this is actually the station that is the background <laughs> for us right now. This is just a different view of it. Right. And you can see that there's a tower at the mouth of the station that helps it get up from ground level to um, the proper cable height. Okay. And how well is that received in the community? Oh, it was received very well. Very it was well. supposed to be a temporary installation, mm -hmm. you know, just for the flower show exhibition. Uh, but they decided to keep it around, and uh, it's, you know, just a good demonstration of what an urban scale gone so let me look like. let me clarify something that was mm -hmm. put in place as a temporary that's right again this and was it was that it was that simple to put in as a temporary could be dismantled yes so the idea <clears throat> with the Berlin one in particular right. is that if the you know Berlin area decides not to keep it around they'll just take down the electromechanical portions they'll take down the cables they'll take down the cabins obviously you can't take away the buildings right. but um, then they could always install that you know equipment somewhere else and still a lot of the values retained so even as a temporary feature it's uh, reasonable to do I find this conversation <laughs> absolutely amazing one because of price two because of speed in which to build it three if if the community doesn't like it it could be dismantled I mean that's true uh, that's this true. is um, oh you're just blowing me away here <laughs> so um, there's gonna be more to look at here so we're gonna take a quick break uh, I'm Tim Apicella this is moving Hawaii forward I'm here with Nicole Horry and we'll be right back thank you very much Hawaii covers stories that matter to tech and to Hawaii. I'm Elise Anderson. And I'm Kaui Lucas. For our show next time, we're doing a Think Tech special, Home Alone and Homeless Alone at Christmas. We want to learn more about the isolated, disconnected people alone in our community. Lots to come on Think Tech. Tune in 10.30 p.m. this Sunday. See you then. Welcome back. Thank you. I'm Tim Apicella, host for Moving Hawaii Forward. Our today's topic is aerial, aerial mobility, Hawaiian skies are the limit, and I'm here with Nicole Hori, and she's discussing um, aerial gondolas and tramways. Thanks again, Thank Nicole, you. and thanks for coming back. 
Uh, it was a quick it break. It's a pleasure to be here, yes. <laughs> it was a quick break. So let's, uh, let's take a look at these pictures. Uh, let's continue on because uh, I find them fascinating. I really do. So this is where we at on our picture here. So uh, this is a picture of the interior of that Koblenz car. Mm -hmm. And you can see it's a much more um, uh, public transportation oriented design than some of the other uh, ski area designs. Uh, but the station, it's, the cars themselves actually have a lot of variants. So uh, because this was a demonstration system, they were able to show multiple versions and you know, just experiment a little bit. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the, the design is sleek and looks nice. Mm -hmm. Now, if we were going to get really fancy, it would be lovely to have one like Chicago's proposing. Uh, they're actually proposing uh, custom, you know, glassed-in cabins. They look absolutely phenomenal, uh, but, you know, it would increase the cost. Right. So you have trade-offs there. There are some really nice options that are just available off the shelf. If we look at the next picture, this is the Symphony Cabin, uh, which is um, partly um, designed by Pinion Farina. This is a famous... Um, designer from Italy. He does and the Ferraris? Yes. Does he not? <laughs> okay. So... Um, Got a Ferrari in the air? <laughs> yes. And, and the interior views of that are also mm -hmm. just really uh, luxurious. Um, here's another one. So this is uh, the plan system for Toulouse and what the cabins would look like for that. So uh, just to give people an idea of what that experience would be like, uh, we're expecting you know, 35 passenger cars coming through the station about once every 20 seconds, so you can easily transition from the rail to getting on at Ala Moana, and then you go to your final destination. So, I and, and and what kind of total cost are we? Okay, so that alignment's <laughs> about how many miles? Um, less than eight. Oh, uh, okay. So actually, to go with uh, that uh, design would be um, about 2.6 total miles. Okay, so. Yeah, so it's not a long uh, distance, but actually the cost is in the stations. So depending on how fancy the stations are, mm -hmm. if we have you know a lovely green roof and you know you know phenomenal curves, it could be absolutely gorgeous, but it could be really expensive. Right. Um, we do think it's going to be something that could be quite iconic. So you don't want to skimp on the design, right. but you also want something that you know fits in with the rest of the transit infrastructure, that fits in with the rail stations, um, that you know is uh, very open air and you know very place appropriate. So um, I am looking at the rail system design um, for some ideas. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about Hawaii and these sort of systems. Mm -hmm. um, how, what kind of reception are you receiving for them? Oh, everyone's excited about it. You know, we do have... Excitement is good. You, you do have some people who mentioned that some people are afraid of heights, mm -hmm. which is true. I don't expect necessarily everyone to want to ride it, but I think people in general are looking forward to benefiting from lower street-level traffic and lo less congestion. Yes, um, you also have, um, you know, a quiet system. So even if you're not riding it, it's not going to be um, something that... Um, interferes with your enjoyment of, you know, your neighborhood. Um, there will be um, the potential for, uh, you know, tinting as it goes past people's windows if it's in an area uh, with towers. So hopefully um, you can enjoy the view where there's a view and then not be looking into people's windows as you right. go past oh, apartment buildings. Oh, interesting point. That's an interesting point. Yes. Okay, no, didn't really think about that, but now you, you've raised it. And so, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then, you know, people are, you know, mentioning the winds. Uh, so that is something where you would have to, you know, consider the possibility of slowing down. Portland does slow down their system when they have high winds. Mm -hmm. Um, but if we look at the 3S system, which has the three cables, it's much more stable, and that's what enables it to operate even up to 100 is in that winds, the, uh, up to Leichner, 100 Is that the Leichner or Leichner system? Uh, so Leichner Poma does Leitner, the system, yeah, okay, and then Doppelmayr does the system. Okay. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of similarities between the two, and uh, you just have to see, you know, how the fits You, you mentioned in. Portland. Um, how long is there, mm -hmm. do you know how long theirs has been in operation? And Oh, let's um, see. How many people are they carrying? Things I like know that? they've carried over 10 million passengers. Really? Yes. So um, I believe uh, there, there's, there's has a kind of challenging configuration because it's on a 
steep hillside and it's you know fitted in with the hospital complex at the top. Mm -hmm. uh, so I know that wasn't trivial for them to build, um, but was it a I government it works project or is it uh, kind of a, a partnership, a private government partnership? So I believe some <clears> of the funding <throat> came from the hospital complex. Right. Okay. Because they wanted uh, to increase mobility up to OHU. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Interesting. Um, and do you know when they installed that system? I think it might have been 2008, oh, but okay. I don't think you should quote me on that. Oh, that's okay. I'm <laughs> not going to hold you anything here yet. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, tell me about what mm -hmm. kind of reception you're getting from um, Hawaii Department of Transportation on this concept. Well, um, I don't know that I've specifically spoken with, you know, I have spoken to various civic leaders, mm -hmm. so... Um, you know, they're, they've expressed interest and they do have some good questions for me. I mean, this and might I'm, be an opportune time. I and mean, we don't know where funding is going to go as far as right. our, our light rail project. We don't know if it's going to really end at Middle Street mm -hmm. and that's going to be the end of the day. We don't know if it's going to have increased, they're going to find increased funding to get us to Ala Moana. We just don't mm -hmm. know. Yeah. And I would think this would be an opportune time for, for folks, or you specifically, <laughs> to introduce this idea as an alternative and... Um, a viable alternative, and I don't know. Well, you, you're, you're probably a one-person lobbying effort, I'm sure, but um, maybe. Yes, maybe certainly. You need some help. The success of the Honolulu aerial depends on the success <clears throat> of the rail, and I think having the Honolulu aerial in place to deliver passengers to the university and to Waikiki, where they really want to go, is really you know something that will help the rail and increase the ridership. Um, and then just you make the whole entire system more cost effective. It's one thing that you can see um, with every successful system is that usually every aerial system is connected to a metro or underground line. Right. The one in Brazil, there's an, um, sorry, not Brazil, Berlin. <laughs> there's an underground right. station right where the first station starts. Um, there's a couple in Paris, the T Toulouse one, and then one um, uh, that are you know being planned to connect to the metro so having that additional ridership and just using the aerial to expand the reach of that system is really important so this is an integrated multimodal concept that can That's work right. and it can work here in honolulu it can it can and um it's something that currently i'm planning to do uh on a private basis i mm -hmm. think that just you know makes things um, simpler, right. um, and still looking at you know potential federal sources of funding and things like that to support the project, but um, you know it's not something that I expect uh, the city to necessarily um, be on the hook for. Mm -hmm. um, and then I am hoping that there would be uh, some operating profits. So the system in Bolivia, Mi Teleférico, mm -hmm. just announced that they had a three million dollar profit for the year. They carried 77 million passengers and also That's came amazing. out you know, with a profit. Because even your best transit systems, are, I'll say bus systems, you're mm -hmm. lucky to get 29 cents on the dollar for fare box recovery. You're lucky at best. Yeah. And most systems only obtain about 4 cents, 5 cents on the fare box. So you're looking at a 95 cent mm -hmm. deficit for you know, a lot of transit systems in the country. And you're telling me that there's a system out there that's operating <laughs> with, with a profit. Well, with their operating profit. Their I'm not sure profit. what their uh, right. you know, investments initially were. But, you know, okay. it's the cost of the system, and going back to the earlier question you had for me, depends very much on the architecture. So if you have a building with, you know, retail integrated into it, maybe some office space or community space, and then you have the aerial as just part of that building, it's, it's hard to say, you know, how much of the cost of that is the aerial. Mm -hmm. um, you can see from... Some of the station's um, costs that are um, even being built here in Hawaii with our high construction costs. Uh, for instance, there's Ho'opili. Mm -hmm. So Ho'opili um, is supposed to cost $14 million. And um, if we look at the picture for that, you can see that you actually get a lot of station for your $14 million. Right, right. Well, don't start off on Ho'opili because I went off last week um, because um, there is a planned development of over tw almost 12,000 houses, and we're talking between Eva and Kapolei. And mm -hmm. the bottom line is, um, I just don't know if there's any more room to put more houses so that <laughs> these people can get on, you know, on the highway and come into downtown. 
And in my mind, a lot of times, I'm hoping that our transportation systems that we're trying to put in place is not a mm -hmm. warrant for developers to say, look, we have this in place, now give us the permit, and we're going to convert our precious agricultural lands into, you know, planned communities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm hoping that these great ideas are not being used as a basis for mm -hmm. us to get approval for permits and, and yeah. build more and build more and build more. So that's just the cynical side of me, and I'm <laughs> sorry I introduced it today, but uh, it came up last week with Jay Fidel, and oh. it, um, it has merit as far as why are we, why mm -hmm. are we putting more houses on, on, on precious ag land? Yeah, well, I think it is a different case where you have uh, an urban area that's already primarily built up. I think with the aerial system, <coughs> you will have some different uses of land. I think there will be more people from Waikiki coming out to explore restaurants and shops along the line. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think it will change the character of the neighborhood too much. Honestly, what is the harshest criticism you've received? Um, is it aesthetics? Is it um, logistics? Is it? Um, I think the greatest skepticism is uh, just in terms of cost. Mm -hmm. Though when you look at you know the potential revenues and the impact on the city, I think it's easy to make the case for it. Mm -hmm. um, so you know it, it is a lot of money to have to raise. Right. But uh, do you see this as a mixed? Um, mode of transportation for both the commuter and tourist or commuter yeah, yeah. and um yeah so i think uh it's most likely that we'll have a uh, most of our riders will just come off the rail and have it integrated as part of their rail fare uh then you'll have other people who pay for a 10 ride pass and let's say they pay 25 dollars to ride the aerial 10 times you know for locals who just ride it intermittently that's you know pretty cost effective mm -hmm. For tourists who are just um, going to be riding it once, you might sell them um, a, like a $6 single ride pass or maybe a $15 day pass. Uh, so you'd have to you know, figure out what would make sense. Right. But it's not something that's cost prohibitive. And certainly a lot of the uh, aerial systems that are targeted at tourists charge more on the order of 30 or $40, uh -huh. we wouldn't charge that much just because we do see ourselves foremost as a commuting tool. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, uh, a couple weeks ago, I had um, Mark Garrity, who is the mm. transit director <laughs> um, from uh -huh. DTS, and he's talking about a project that they're working on. It's a smart card technology. But the nice thing about smart card technology is you can integrate the fare structure between rail, bus, yes. and potentially um, an, aerial, an aerial system. So that would be very nice if this all could come into place. <laughs> yes. Um, what's the next move? What's your next? What's the next move to try to see if this thing could be uh, realistically implemented in in Honolulu? Well, uh, certainly, I think looking at what's going on in Missouri, where they have the memorandum of understanding with the city, that provides uh, the uh, developers uh, five-year exclusivity on the concept of building an aerial system that enables them to invest in the engineering, uh, to develop, you know, the routing and you know, just make sure that you have, you know, the correct locations. Um, the memorandum of understanding assumes that the city will also tell them what um, the city is looking for. So if the city is planning on, you know, having a lot of visitors go to one area or another, um, and they do have a lot of visitors. They have about eight million a year, okay. which is on par with Hawaii. Though right. I assume they only most only stay for a day, um, but they're expecting to, you know, stop off at multiple tourist locations, and then the city can help them figure out which places make the most sense. So they do have stations mapped out theoretically, but they're going to be working on their engineering and design uh, now right. that they have the memorandum of understanding. Oh, fantastic. Well, fingers crossed. Um, <laughs> would you come back and give us an update as we move, well, hopefully move forward with of this? Of course, of uh, course. I would love to have you here and hear more about it. Yeah. But uh, we're out of time, and as usual, I have more questions than I have time today. So I'm going to say that it's the end of 2016, and I'd like to give a special thanks for those that have helped me uh, hobble along with uh, putting this show together, and a special thanks to Zuri Bender, Ian Davison, Robert McLean, and Nick Sexton. This is Moving Hawaii Forward. I'm Tim Apicella, and we'll see you in 2017. Happy New Year.